as Peter said, my original background is nanophysics and quantum optics, but in the past few years, we've become uh, interested a lot in applying machine learning to physics problems, like uh, inventing better quantum computers. But uh, today, I'm concentrating on the other direction, which is using physics for proving machine learning. So let's jump right in. Uh, you all know, of course, we all know about the deep learning revolution. So by now we can recognize images better than humans can do, or computers can recognize images better than humans can do. Uh, computers can play games better than humans can do, and at least they can write text that superficially looks as good as what uh, humans can do, unless you start to read it in detail. <laughs> now, uh, this is a slide uh, somehow putting in a cartoon version what Peter already told us before, that is there's an exponential explosion of the resources that is needed to do both inference and training, or that we are going to these large language models and to the models that can produce pictures for us. So that uh, brings up a question. So uh, only big companies sometimes can do uh, the training that's needed here. So that's already bad for academic labs, but also overall, uh, this is... Uh, um, uh, this drives the question, can we build better hardware? Better hardware that is fast, that is highly parallel, that is energy efficient. So that brings up the whole field of neuromorphic computing. So that's, of course, a very, very wide field. And I'm only indicating a few of the aspects here. So in the upper line, you'll find uh, approaches coming from solid state physics, for example, based on MRISTERs, based on spintronic oscillators, based on superconducting circuits where you might embed magnetic elements in order to also incorporate some uh, kind of memory. And then in the lower line, I collected a few examples of optical uh, approaches to build something akin to neural networks. For example, you can have free space propagation leading to these complex speckle patterns, which you can then use for purposes of machine learning, or you can build integrated photonic devices simply also including some materials like phase change materials that allow you to have some kind of memory and to have some kind of tunable parameters in these devices. So that's from solid state and from optics. Of course, as uh, Avin just pointed out, also the soft matter community is looking into how can, uh, can physical systems learn, for example, mechanical networks that can be trained to uh, execute a certain task if you uh, if you set them up in just the right way. So uh, that brings us to the uh, main question that I want to address in this talk, which is namely training. How can we do training based on physical dynamics? And so in this talk, I will be uh, giving you the outlines of two uh, recent works of ours. And this is the first one where I want to spend a little bit more time. That is a new technique to learn uh, in a other white, uh, class of platforms, which we termed Hamiltonian echo backpropagation, reasons that hopefully will become clear as I go along to explain this new technique to you. Now, here's a cartoon of how I think of a physical learning machine. I have a kind of black box device inside of which can be many degrees of freedom. They might be mechanical degrees of freedom like uh, vibrations of molecules or some <laughs> kind of mechanical uh, gears. Uh, you could have electrical circuits or you could have waves propagating inside this device. Later on, when I talk about actual uh, implementations, I will concentrate on, say, optics. So think of optical waves. And uh, we want to imagine the situation where we have some input coming into this device. Again, imagine a wave packet being sent into the device, undergoing this uh, very complex nonlinear dynamics and finally emerging at the other end. So the hope would be that this becomes an information processing device and that if you send in different inputs, it will give rise to different outputs. And in addition to that, you hope that there are tunable parameters inside the device so that you can teach it to do the kind of information processing that you really want to have. So on a more abstract level, we would say there are some degrees of freedom. I call them psi. Think of a wave field, if you like. That represents the signal going from input to output and being distorted by this complex nonlinear dynamics. And then other degrees of freedom, here I call them theta in reference to what people in the machine learning field mm -hmm. like to call them. These are trainable and they can influence the dynamics of the signal field so that you can uh, actually do some machine learning. So the question is how to learn, how to find the correct values of these trainable parameters in order to get what you want. Now, there is one technique that in principle always works, and this is simply to uh, send in 
input uh, for some given training samples, look at the output that results. And then if the output um, not quite what you wanted, let's change the trainable parameters in a small way and see whether the output comes closer to what you really wanted to have. Now, this will, will work always, but it has a big catch. Only if you have a million different trainable parameters, you need to run uh, the device a million times in order to get closer to what you want to have. And in order to appreciate this fact, let's uh, take a step back and let's have a look at how usual artificial neural networks are trained. So this is a usual artificial neural network with its neurons connected by weights that are the trainable parameters. And uh, what you could always do in principle is to change one of these weights and um, understand what uh, influence this change will have downstream uh, up to the output uh, of the neural network. Then if you like the change, you keep it. And if it went into the wrong direction, you change the parameters in the other direction. So this is the parameter shift method. But again, it scales extremely unfavorable, namely the number of parameters. What we really do in artificial neural networks is very different. We look at the output, which is a nonlinear function of the input uh, written in a recursive way. And then we can take gradients of the output with respect to these parameters in the network. And if you apply the simple chain rule of differentiation, you will quickly find that this amounts to going through the network in the backward direction. And that gives rise to the famous uh, rule of uh, back propagation that underlies all of deep learning these days. So if we didn't have that, there would be no deep learning because it's so efficient that for the price of one forward propagation, also now uh, get uh, all the uh, gradients with respect to all the trainable parameters inside your artificial neural network. The catch uh, with that is that's a mathematical algorithm, which you can easily implement on the computer, but it's not immediately obvious but to also implement it in a physical system. And to drive home the same point again, that uh, back propagation and gradient-based approaches are a little bit alien to, say, more physics-based approaches, here I want to remind you what we are really trying to do is to minimize some kind of cost function that measures the deviation between the desired output and the actual output. And we do that by simple gradient descent, always sliding down uh, this uh, cost function landscape. If you compare this against what is happening in biological networks, that's very different. In a biological network, do not calculate some gradient of the output with respect to all the trainable parameters. Rather, what's happening as far as we can tell, and of course, people are still investigating, is that we always have local learning rules. So for example, uh, the Hebbian learning rule neurons that fire together, wire together. So if two uh, pulses arrive at the same time and trigger another output pulse, then these connections will be strengthened. That's obviously a local learning rule. That would be very nice to have also in a physical system because physical interactions are local. And that is uh, not at all obvious how this can be connected to the more global uh, gradient calculation that backpropagation uh, provides us. Okay. And so uh, as a kind of um, overview here, I collected together, say, maybe not all, but most of the training techniques known for training neuromorphic devices. Um, let's start here. If you have reservoir computing, you just keep the fixed, complex, nonlinear dynamics of a physical system, and then you stack on top of that a neural network, which you train in order to get the output that you really wanted. You can also apply the parameter shift method. I just discussed this a moment ago. You can also try to do backpropagation on a simulation. This has its disadvantages uh, because maybe the simulation doesn't quite fit uh, the uh, real physical system, but uh, as Peter has, and his team introduced, you can do a hybrid approach where you have on the one side that propagation in a simulation and on the other side run a forward uh, inside a real physical setup. Then that uh, still uh, brings up the question, can we do also physical ways of backpropagation? And uh, these ideas in one way or another have been around for quite some time, starting with a absolutely pioneering work uh, by uh, Psaltis in the 80s. Uh, the idea was that at least for particular special physical systems, if you engineer them in the right way, you can have physical uh, ways of back propagating uh, through the system and reading off the gradients that you need in order to update your parameters. For a much wider class of systems that was introduced recently by uh, Scalier and Benjo in 2017, the technique of equilibrium propagation, if you have systems that are thermalizing, this technique tells you in a physical way how to get all the gradients with respect to the parameters of these systems in order to update these parameters. And then that uh, brings us to the question I want to answer in the following, namely, can we have 
an equally general way of doing physical backpropagation and at the same time also produce physical updates of the trainable parameters in a purely physical way, so by the physical dynamics of the system. So that's uh, the question we set out to answer. We have our black box physical system, degrees of freedom that have their own dynamics, theta and psi, let's say two coupled wave fields. We want to have some approach, get both physical backpropagation with its efficiency and a physical learning update of the trainable degrees of freedom. The goal will be still this optimization of the cost function that measures uh, the distance between the output and the target. Uh, but the question is how to get these uh, gradients and how to apply them. And the uh, technique, the approach that we introduced, that we came up with, uh, relies on having quite an arbitrary Hamiltonian, the only uh, particular condition that we impose will be that the Hamiltonian has to be time reversal invariant. And that includes a very wide class of systems. Thus, we also need a kind of time reversal operation that sounds a little bit like magic, but people in optics know how to do this. You can take a wave field psi and in a physical way turn it into psi star. So if the wave packet had been running to the right, it will be running to the left. Before I go a little bit into the mathematics of how this works, I want to illustrate it in a kind of cartoon version on a mechanical uh, toy model, which I call the self-learning pinball machine. And I hope that makes it pretty clear what we are about to do. Imagine you have a system with only two degrees of freedom, namely the positions of this purple ball and the red ball. Purple ball represents the kind of signal that I want to process, and the red ball represents kind of the trainable degree of freedom in the system. Now, uh, your input is encoded in the position of this purple ball, which will then be sent through the system. And because these balls can interact with each other, for example, both of them are charged, I will have some more or less complicated trajectory, and then my purple ball will end up at some location on the other end, which represents the output of this very simple pinball machine. Now, maybe I'm not happy with this kind of output because maybe I wanted this purple ball a little bit to the right. Now, what I will do at this point in time is I apply a time reversal operation, which for a mechanical system simply means switching around the velocities. If that were all that I would do at this point in time, I would just have the movie running backwards, ideally. Now, that, of course, is boring. But will, what I will do in addition is I will give a slight nudge, a slight perturbation to this purple ball in the direction of the desired output, which will then in turn mean that the trajectory running backwards is not quite the same as the trajectory running forwards, which means that the kick that the purple ball imposes on the red ball is, again, not quite the same kick that it gave in the forward direction, which means the, the red ball will not end up sitting in the end at the location that it was sitting in the beginning, but it will have shifted a little bit. Now, there the mathematics comes in, and there you have to believe me at this point. Namely, if I now try to do the same experiment again with the same input location of the purple ball, it turns out that the purple ball, in the end, because of this shift in what the red ball was doing, uh, will move a little bit in, uh, in the direction of the desired output. And this is true as a way of learning, obviously. And this is true even if I have a more complex arbitrary potential in which everything moves. It only needs to be a still uh, time reversal invariant, so magnetic fields are not allowed. Plus, of course, it not only works for two degrees of freedom, but also for, in principle, thousands of degrees of freedom. So coming a little bit to the mathematics of this, a uh, technique that we call Hamiltonian echo backpropagation. First, you have the forward ev evolution, then you have this time reversal operation, and then you have this backward echo evolution, I call it. Plus, of course, as I already explained in this toy example, at the time of the time reversal operation, you also inject this small error signal, so you nudge it in the direction of the desired output, uh, which more technically means uh, you inject a signal proportional to the derivative of the cost function with respect to the signal psi. And then I'm skipping uh, a few um, aspects here. Result will be that the interaction between the theta degrees of freedom and the psi degrees of freedom in the end will result in an update of theta in the direction of the desired gradient of the cost function. And so uh, explain to you why that works. Uh, let me first say, both theta and psi are really dynamical degrees of freedom. So theta is not just some tunable beam splitter ratio. 
this really a dynamical degree of freedom, like another field. I can combine them both in a field capital phi. Time reversal operation in this complex notation would be phi going to phi star. If I have a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, it also means that then the uh, field will undergo a dynamics, which is just the time reversed of the original dynamics in the forward bus. Now, what do I need in order to get the gradient of the cost function with respect to the parameters theta? Well, what I would need in principle is something akin to the parameter shift method that I introduced in the beginning. So I would have to ask, okay, if I change theta a tiny little bit, what does that mean for the dynamics? Changing things a tiny little bit is just a linear perturbation. So I'm asking for something like the Green's function of the forward dynamics. But if you look at the mathematics, you find that the gradient of the cost function with respect to theta, what it really means is something like this, uh, a joint of the Green's function of the forward dynamics calculated for this particular, on top of this particular nonlinear evolution of the field phi. So that's why I have this index here. And then the mathematics tells you that if you have a time reversal invariant system, a particular version of the forward Green's function is related to the Green's function sitting on top of the backwards evolution of this nonlinear field phi. And so uh, this is very nice because what this means is the mathematics enables us to take what we need and turn it in, into something that we have physical access to. And so um, this only works because we have a time reversal invariant system. And if I skip a few other steps, it results in uh, what I promised you, namely that the resulting shift in the uh, theta degrees of freedom is exactly in the direction that I need. Okay. So um, what would that really look like for wave fields, which is the application we have in uh, mind? You have a space-time diagram of a wave field dispersing in a complicated way. At some time, you apply the time reversal operation everything magically in principle reconverges. And uh, what we ask you to do is to inject this little error signal to nudge it in the right uh, direction at this point in time. And the uh, claim is that then the resulting uh, joint evolution of psi and theta will result in the desired training update for theta. So the way this would work in an actual experiment would be uh, depicted here. So again, a space-time diagram. The blue box represents, so to speak, the physical nonlinear core, like a nonlinear crystal. Uh, it would send through both the psi and theta as, say, wave packets, and then time reverse them. They go back. Then you throw away the psi belonging to the first training sample. You inject the second training sample. You send both of them through again and again, and so on. And over time, what this means is that theta changes itself uh, in the direction that you need in order to get the desired input-output uh, uh, processing. So no idea is without a background, of course. So we can compare to uh, precursor works. So one is the one that I already mentioned by Psaltis uh, in the 80s already. But they, it was quite similar. It involved some kind of time reversal operation. But it also differed in an important way uh, which then meant they had to pay the price uh, that they had to engineer the nonlinear dynamics of their wave propagation in such a way that the backward propagation uh, would be related to the forward propagation in a very particular way. It's not uh, agnostic to the physics platform. It only works for a particular engineered platform. And then there was this recent work by Shanhui's group, which many of you also know, which introduced some more general physical backprop in a optics platform, but it did not include any way physically updating the parameters. Okay. So that's a brief summary. Are you really sure? I started late. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a way of doing physical backpropagation with physical learning update in a Hamiltonian independent manner. And we also ran a first numerical examples. For example, if I have two coupled wave fields, psi and theta interacting with a or nonlinearity, and I want to train this little system in order to do, for example, XOR, uh, then uh, here you, uh, you see what, what's happening. So I have, uh, say, encoded the input in the location of wave packets in the Psi field. As these wave packets are propagating, I introduce a certain um, dynamics of the theta field, which is here displayed in terms of a color scale. And you can see this now as time uh, runs. So in the forward pass, and you have this time reversal operation. 
go through the backward pass, you see that almost all the change in theta will be deleted again, except for a small remaining change in theta due to the injection of the error signal. And then this gives you your learning update. We can also do this for more complicated examples like image classification. And then we can ask questions like, how does the strength of the nonlinearity uh, affect what's going on? Uh, can you choose a particular optimal strength of the nonlinearity? And for possible experimental platforms, what you always require is a good nonlinearity for good expressivity, low loss, so that you are approximately time reversal invariant. And then you uh, want to have a time reversal operation. Uh, one example that we're currently working on together with a group of Dirk Englund uh, is to have integrated optics where you have resonators, uh, including some nonlinear material. Uh, but in principle, you could also think of other platforms like superconducting microwave circuits. Now, I know that I'm practically out of time, but let me just announce another uh, work that we introduced recently, uh, because the idea we think is quite interesting, which is you, you can have a linear wave scattering system and yet do nonlinear information processing. Uh, and uh, the way this works is, I can skip ahead. Uh, if you look at a linear wave propagation system, then the output is related to the input via the scattering matrix. Now, that's only a linear relation, so it's not very expressive. So you cannot use it to recognize uh, images, for example. But what you can realize is that the scattering matrix can depend on parameters like beam splitter ratios and so on. And what you can do is you can inject the input, not via this probe port, but in terms of these parameters. And injecting the input into a scattering matrix in terms of the parameters, that does lead uh, to a nonlinear uh, relation between output and input. And so that's a new idea, which works uh, really nicely because there's a vast variety of linear wave propagation platforms around, of course. We also have found a good way so read of the gradients that you need for backpropagation, namely the derivatives of the scattering matrix with respect to the parameters that you can train, turns out is given by basically a product of two Green's functions or scattering matrices, which can be read off by a physical observation if you do it right uh, from your system. Okay, so with that, uh, let me uh, switch to the final slide and thank you for your attention. All right, thanks very much. So we've uh, we've let the uh, summit plan for the question as as we're hoping to do the senior invited talks of twenty five plus five. We're going to go a little bit into the break, but I think that's okay. So, uh, right, who who has the first question? Um, have you ever looked at the predictive coding paradigm that the neuroscientists have been working on? Say it again. Predictive coding paradigm. Uh, I don't know very much about this, so. Uh... If you think it's related to any of the things I'm saying, I'm happy to talk to you. I think this is a physical implementation and that's very interesting. Okay. I'm happy to take the, yep. I was wondering, so you insisted on uh, time reversal invariance yep. because you want one of the equations of the type, um, the forward pass is Green's function equals the reverse. Um, so for example, in dissipative systems, in statistical physics, you don't have an equality, but there are these fluctuations theorems that tell you the forward thing equals the reverse thing up to this known factor. So if you leave this, if you have an equation, then with that, you just don't go through. Uh, I, I'm, af I'm afraid that this is a little bit complica uh, complicated to, to do. Of course, we have asked ourselves the question, what if we have a dissipation? So the first thing that we tell people is uh, try to keep it as low as possible. <laughs> second, uh, The second thing is, of course, um, the point is, even if you put in some amplification, that could be something you do. You, know, you, you run your wave from left to right, you put in some amplification uh, and then do the time reversal operation. But then still this does not result in the proper time reversed uh, version of the forward propagated signal. Uh, you can imagine how the exponential decay just doesn't fit in the forward and backward pass. So for particular platforms now that we are investigating, sometimes it is possible to compensate for the dissipation injecting the right amplification at the right spot, uh, but these are particular cases. Now, I think what you're referring to is still yet quite a different direction to talk about this. I think I got a question in this direction already at another conference. I still don't see the connection to these uh, fluctuation dissipation theorems. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so when you think about computing with physical systems, we learned that a good question to ask is, um, what happens when you dis uh, dis decrease the amplitude of the input? Right? When you want to do low energy, like high efficiency computing, you have to think about what happens when you decrease the amplitude of the information. So then at the end, uh, the, you have to deal with uh, measurement, right? Then you, you have to measure the field and, uh, and you have to then uh, decide to reverse that. How does it look then when you, <clears throat> the scheme look, when you think about sampling the system through measurements in order to calculate um, how to revert the propagation? You know, imagine you're operating with very low number of photons in a complex optical environment. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, I want to point out the way we imagine it is, of course, we do have physical time reversal, which exists uh, for wave fields. But it's also true that sometimes maybe that becomes too cumbersome and you want to do exactly what you uh, pose, namely you want to measure and then time reverse uh, whatever outside to tell you or by some analog device and then re-inject. Um, and then there would come up the question of noise, which also comes up, by the way, if you even do the physical time reversal operation, but maybe there, uh, you are operating at uh, low levels, uh, some shot noise comes in from the pump and so on. So we explored a little bit by way of simulations the um, effects of noise in this time reversal operation. And so the uh, outcome of these simulations is that uh, Usually, ideally, mathematically, we would want you to inject an infinitely tiny error signal. But of course, that's no longer true if you have noise. So then there will be a sweet spot where the error signal is large enough to overcome the noise, but still small enough so that you're mostly in the linearized regime around your original dynamics. And so these are then questions that come up. But another question that is related is, of course, do quantum effects come in? Would you uh, extend this to a quantum um, Version of this kind of Hamiltonian echo back propagation. But there's the catch that, um, as you know, of course, the time reversal operation itself is not a unitary operation. They always have to uh, feed in some external degrees of freedom that uh, automatically, fundamentally generate noise. So in the quantum regime, there's even a fundamental need to inject noise, and we still don't know what that would mean here. So uh, does this work for chaotic systems? Well, okay, very good. Good question. So what we want to have is a nonlinear system that is expressive enough, which means that in principle it is a chaotic system, but remember that the time of propagation through the device is of course finite. And so what we find empirically is you want the time of propagation to be something like maybe a few Lyapunov times, so you, you already see something of the complex dynamics, but not so long that every tiny uh, non-ideality gets completely blown up. Example that it's a bound on the system side, so to speak, yeah, in this toy model, yeah, we, we of course do the simulations more on the optics side, which is of interest to us. Thanks for the great talk. So, when you think about a neural network crossbar array that you're comparing to, say, with RAM, you can still think of that as a physical system, which is getting a physical weight update in its resistance. Mm -hmm. So, can you more? Clearly explain the comparison to something like that, why, how that's different, even though it's still a physical update in some way. Um, so first of all, uh, if I think of the systems you, you think of, these will not be, uh, our method of Hamiltonian echo back propagation will not work for them, simply because they are dissipative, obviously, so you need something very different. If you go to the extreme limit where they become thermalizing systems, you want to ask, Benjamin, about equilibrium propagation, of course. Uh, but I think what you meant is maybe that the the overall, say, digital information processing is, of course, still physical. Yeah. So I completely agree with this. Of course, everything that happens in this universe is physical. Uh, but I think for me, the difference is a little bit also like Avent and Peter explained. Uh, do I come from what my physical systems can more naturally do without working too hard? do you give me specifications and then I engineer? But I guess maybe there's a gradient between these limits. And I guess what you're saying is you still couldn't do this with an RM because the RM is too distant. 
Uh, yeah, so our particular technique wouldn't work uh, in, in that case. Yeah, that, that's another question. Move the sliding docks. I'm not sure if I'm missing hands, but I don't think so. Okay, I have one final question, I know. Is, uh, um, can you explain a little bit the distinction between the two papers you presented, with the second one being, of course, just flashing? Uh, explain a little bit about how that the method and training there is the same or different from the one in the first paper. Uh, okay, so the second is really not about having a general method to get back propagation. Yeah, it's, it's very particular to this linear wave propagation platform to get the gradient. And also in the second case, it's one of those examples where you do not get the physical update on your own. You would have to read out the gradient and then apply it, which it shares with many other techniques. So I, as far as we know, the Hamiltonian echo back propagation is actually the only technique on the market that also gives you the physical update by physical dynamics. Awesome. Well, with that, let's uh, thank Florian again for the wonderful talk. Thanks. <laughs> One logistical announcement, and I think we have some more. Uh, One logistical announcement I have is that we're going to go into a coffee break, and we're going to resume here with the next session on schedule at 10 a.m., but um, it looks like you're... <laughs>